The paradox of the plankton is the fact that there seems to be way, way too many species of plankton for what limited resources they have to share. Like, there are around 20,000 known species of phytoplankton, which are specifically plankton that can photosynthesize energy from the sun. And MIT estimates that there are probably around 100,000 species of phytoplankton altogether. Individual plankton are called plankters, and it's estimated that there are one quintillion photosynthesizing plankters in the world's oceans. That's a million billion dengol plankters, and they produce about half of the world's oxygen. And all those species of plankton seem to compete for the same resources, like light, nitrates, phosphates, and iron. But in ecology, there's a principle called the competitive exclusion principle. When multiple species coexist in a habitat and compete for the same resources, one species generally outcompetes the rest. And then that species will dominate the others with competitive advantage. So the other species will either go extinct or they'll have to evolve or change their behavior to fill a different ecological niche. A classic example from ecologist Robert MacArthur in 1958 explains how five different species of warblers can coexist in the same spruce trees in Maine. All five species of the warblers mostly eat insects and forage in spruce trees, so they seemingly directly compete with each other. But what he found is that different warbler species primarily forage in different parts of the tree. The Cape May warbler forages in the valuable top part of the tree. And the Myrtle warbler is resigned to forage in the bottom of the trees. And when they stay in their own lane, they compete with each other less and have access to different insect prey. MacArthur called this way of getting around the competitive exclusion principle by carving out your own specific niche, resource partitioning. For the other kind of example, North America's eastern gray squirrel was introduced to England in the late 1800s, where it competes directly with the native red squirrel. In the 1870s, there were an estimated 3.5 million red squirrels in the UK, but there are only somewhere around 150,000 today. They don't even regularly fight each other directly, but the eastern gray squirrel has a number of advantages. First, they don't got their natural North American predators messing with them. They also regularly carry and live with the squirrel pox virus, which really quickly kills red squirrels. And on top of all that, red squirrels are larder hoarders and regularly drop all their nuts in a big single stash. But gray squirrels are scatter hoarders, regularly hide their nuts all over the place, and also regularly pilfer red squirrel caches. So if nothing's done about it, the eastern gray squirrel will eventually outcompete the red squirrel throughout its Eurasian range, and the red squirrel will go extinct. Alright, back to plankton. Scientists have been trying to find ways to explain the diversity of plankton since 1961. That's when the paradox of the plankton was first described by British ecologist G. Evelyn Hutchinson. He suggested a few ways to resolve the paradox himself, like how light behaves in the ocean. Obviously, it gets darker the deeper you go, but also different wavelengths of light get absorbed at different rates. Red light gets absorbed faster than blue light, which makes a vertical gradient of light in the water. And that means that light itself is in a singular ecological resource. It's actually a multitude of resources depending on how deep you go in the water. And it turns out that there's a huge variety of photosynthetic pigments that different species of plankton use to photosynthesize different wavelengths of light. Another explanation is that the ocean is hardly a static environment. Wind, waves, and competing currents make a chaotic environment, especially for microscopic organisms. So there might never be enough environmental consistency for any single species to hold on to its competitive advantage. Yet another possible explanation is either called the boom and busted or kill the winner hypothesis. The idea is that viruses mediate how successful any single species of phytoplankton can be. Because it's estimated that viruses kill around 20% of all the bacteria in the ocean every single day. And when conditions are just right for any specific species, they have what's called a bloom and outcompete all the other species of plankton. Sometimes you can even see plankton blooms from space. But having so many of the same species congregating in the same place makes a perfect environment for viruses to come on in and take them down a peg. And when they get wiped out, other species find a new space to hang and continue reproducing. Altogether, there are dozens of possible explanations for the plankton paradox. And many scientists believe that there will always be enough chaotic stuff going on in the ocean for no single species to ever retain their favor. And that there will always be surprising diversity amongst them. 